Bob, Dr. Maclevitis is back. This is Mac Voices. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Headspace. Meditation made simple. Visit headspace.com slash macvoices for a free one-month trial. Welcome to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, it's been a long time since we got to talk to Bob, Dr. Maclevitis, so naturally we decided to pick on him right in the middle of um, a winter attack on Texas. Bob, it's great to see you. I'm I'm glad you're in one piece. And in a Hawaiian shirt. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, that makes no sense whatsoever. (laughs) Well, it's 73 degrees today. It's like the whole thing's over, but it only just melted away, and you know, as you can imagine... Austin, Texas is not known for having a lot of snow removal equipment. Actually, we have none, zero. Uh, And no salt or gravel or sand trucks, because why would we need that? So when it snows, so first it rained, it was about 35 and it rained, and then it dropped to about 15. So all of that rain turned into black ice coating all the trees and the streets, making it dangerous to even go outside, much less go anywhere. Nobody could get there. I, I live in a neighborhood with a pretty steep hill to get in, and it was impassable. You, and even in all-wheel drive, I mean, for the first three days, it was sheet ice. You just couldn't could get up it. You needed uh, spikes in your boots. That's what my son has in Montana, snow spikes. But that, uh, you couldn't get up the hill. It was just slick as ice. And then it rained and snowed again. And then it stayed below zero for two more days. So we we had about five days. First, the electric grid failed. And uh, they they started rolling blackouts. Hour and a half of power, hour and a half without power. Hour and a half of power, hour and a half without. You could set your watch by it. Uh, So my power was in and out about 15 times, or 20 maybe. And... Luckily, I'm semi-retired, so I just turned off all my like routers and, and everything else because my wife had the good sense to fly to Florida the day before and couldn't get back. So it was just me here, and I'm thinking, I don't, I don't need Wi-Fi. You know? I mean, if the power's out, when it comes back on, maybe I'll turn the Wi-Fi on. But I, I certainly didn't want to keep trying things with power surges on and off and on and off. And sometimes it would come on and flicker and go back off. And it's like, oh, that's really terrible for electronics. I just unplugged everything from the wall and went for about three days without, you know, anything. I had cellular uh, iPhone. So, you know, I could get my email, my text messages. I could talk to people. And I didn't really need to be running any electronics in the house. But it's kind of weird. Like I said to you when I came in, gee, I don't know why that light's not on. I haven't been in the office like in a week. Because other than to turn the turn the Wi-Fi back on, I, I wasn't really using the computer or anything. Uh, it was crazy. I mean, we've never had. I've lived here 34 years, and this was 10 times more snow and cold than I've ever seen. Maybe 15 or 16. It was just a. a, a what, what can I say on a on a PG-13 show? A crap ton. I, I think I can get away with that. That works. There was just snow than ever it was unbelievable so i i couldn't leave the house for literally five days because I, I couldn't drive my car anywhere i mean i guess i could have left the house but there was no reason to since my car was covered in snow and ice <clears throat> and so were the streets that's the bad news the good news is we never had a long power outage so none of my food spoiled and i had lots of food uh and beer and then the water failed, but I had lots of water too. So it was kind of like having a staycation without cable TV, without without uh, streaming TV. And then after about three days, they got the power grid stable, and the power's been on ever since. So uh, since then, we had no water, and we couldn't really go out the first couple of days after the power came back because it was still too slippery. So I did some binge watching, and I don't know. It's been relaxing. <laughs> Not being able to go out. I have no responsibilities. I don't have to go to the grocery store. I don't have to, don't have to do anything except write two columns a week. Okay, so there are a couple of things I wanted to talk to you about. The first one, though, it 
is, is it relates to this. Um, you went through sort of a technology purge without deciding to. You it was forced upon you, and I find it really intriguing that you don't seem to be more agitated about it. I I think I would have been driving no. myself slowly crazy. See, here's the thing. I've been my son moved to Montana, and I've I've gone camping for a week with him a couple times now, and been with you know basically without any connection for five days at a time, four days at a time, or with a connection you know, every second day for five days or six days, you know, not really connected wherever I was. And I kind of like, the only thing I don't like is when I turn it back on and I have 9,000 emails to, to wade through. But, uh, you know, the, the, the relief of not having to look at it and see what needs to be attended to right now and not worrying about what's, you know, I have no fear of missing out. Whatever's going on on Facebook will be there when, when I get my power back. And I don't really care that much. Um, I don't care who's, who's calling me names on Twitter. And, you know, I can live without that stuff. I'm older than you, Chuck, but I'm, I, I think I've matured when it comes to like having to have social media and connectivity. If I don't have it, hmm, it's kind of like a vacation. I did a lot of reading because I had an iPad. And lots of batteries. So I had books books to read galore. I have the Libby app. Do you have the Libby app? Is that the one you use to uh, borrow books from the library? It used to be library? called Overdrive. Yep, yep, yep. yep. It used yeah. to be called Overdrive. It's so great. It's like, I love to read, but I don't love to pay 20 bucks for a book I read in three days. And then completely, you know, a week later, I don't even remember what it was about. I read a lot of mysteries and stuff. And it just... I, I, I used to buy a lot of books and then I used to buy a lot of ebooks and now I buy some and I, I have an audible subscription. So I buy audiobooks. but you know, for stuff like there's a series I'm reading where there's 54 books in the series. It's like, I'm not going to buy 54, $20 books to read them all, but the library lets me sign up for them and get on the wait list. If they only have a minimal amount of copies and you know, they tell me when it's ready. And then I have 21 days to read it. And I can read pretty much any novel in less than 21 days. So I love this Libby app. If it works with your library, you should love the Libby app. Everybody, including you, Chuck. So I, I, can't, I can't let that go, Bob. So what, what series has 54 books in it? It's the Eve Dallas series by uh, J.R. Robb. It's actually Nora Roberts. but. This is her her sci fi ish series. Maybe there's not fifty five. Maybe there's forty two. But there's just way <laughs> too many to try to buy them all and read them all. And they're long. They're three, four, five hundred pages. Wow, it's a great series. It's really fun. Eve Dallas is a detective in the year twenty one fifty something, and you know New York is pretty scary, and she's this badass cop. And she's married to the richest guy in the world, and you know, so she's got lots of uh, lots of cool tech at her at, at her uh, disposal that may or may not be legal. It's really it's fun to read. It sounds like it. Okay, so there's yeah, something to do, I'm folks. Looking for again, yeah, really for I mean, mindless pleasure. It's, it's, you're not going to learn anything, but it can keep you amused, especially when there's a power outage. Like I think I read a couple of them during the power outage. Just something to, you know, like airplane trips. That's a good airplane kind of read. It's also good on a beach. If you're a beach person, you like to take a book to the beach. That's the kind of book, you know. They're page turners and they're fun and the characters are, are interesting. There's a sense of sameness after about the 15th one you read. But, you know, I mean. <laughs> yeah, but that's true of probably any series. Most series. Yeah, well. So. Ian Fleming was very fortunate to die after 11 or 13 books because that's the body of work now. I mean, he probably could have written for two books a year for the next 20 years and they wouldn't have been as good. You know who did write a lot of good books, though, um, in that in that vein is the guy that wrote Nero Wolf, Rex Stout. There's about 40, probably 30 or 40. They're short. They're novellas, I think. They're, you know, not necessarily full-length novels, but Arch, Archie Griff, Archie, Archie what? Archie Goodwin and uh, Nero Wolf. 
that's one that didn't go on too long. He wrote until he was like 80 something and a couple of year. It just added up to a lot. I have a hundred, almost a hundred books out now. I, I counted the other day. It's nine, 91 and I'm going to go for a hundred. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do the updates to my MacBook, my iPhone book, maybe my garage band book, my iPad book until I get to a hundred or die. And then I'm retiring for sure. Maybe not. Maybe I'll say 94 is plenty and quit next year. I don't know. I mean, I just keep doing It's like, remember the movie Groundhog Day? It's like, I, my life is Groundhog Day. Every year I get these books back to rewrite again. And it's like the Mac, Mac OS book. I started writing with System 7.5. So think about how many editions I've updated. It's been an update per major release every year. So there were System 7, 8, and 9. Right, and then ten, and then eleven. There were how many tens? Thirteen or fourteen tens, and there were probably ten or fifteen, six, seven, eight, nines. Also, do you do you remember? I, I just somebody just reminded me of this. The Mac OS book was the uh, what came in the box when you bought a power computing computer. We didn't have a manual. We had. Mac OS 7.5 for dummies. Hmm. So I, I have the impression, though, that we may see a new project here, uh, the Bob Levitis Book Club. Look out, Oprah. No, I actually uh, convert. No, but I did retire from working smarter for Mac users last year. And at the end of the year, when I when I was done offering it and it was it's it's being sunsetted, um, I changed my website, even though it's still called Working Smarter for Mac Users. It's now a gallery of my wood art that I make. I make things in wood. That's what I'm doing. That's my new career, for sure. I'm not a book club guy. I don't know. It's that, it sounded like the, uh, the, the the power outage may have turned you into one for a minute. Uh, well, it did. The, 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 here's the thing. I've always loved to read, and I'm a fast reader, and I can read novels. I mean, if I'm if I don't have anything else to do, like when I travel and I've got all this downtime in airports and on airplanes, I love it because I can catch up on my reading. So otherwise I'm busy and I don't sit down and read too much because I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little ADD and I just kind of bounce from one thing to another. And if I'm not forced to read, I don't. So it, it kind of, it's one of those things where when I'm at home, I read, but I don't read at, at nearly the volume that I do when I travel or when the power's out or when there's nothing else to do or when I hate the people I'm with. <laughs> I'm not going to touch that one. I'm staying away from that one. This edition of Mac Voices is supported by Headspace. Headspace is meditation made simple. What is stressing you out? In today's world, a better question might be, what isn't stressing you out? Work? Home? Grieving? Overall stress? And how is it affecting you? Short views? Can't sleep? Feeling overwhelmed? Lots of questions and not many answers. But one of those answers could and should be Headspace. Headspace is a daily dose of mindfulness in the form of guided meditations in an easy-to-use app that can help you make your way through whatever your challenges. Wind-down sessions can help you get a good night's sleep. A short three-minute SOS meditation can help you with that overwhelmed feeling. The Headspace app has over 600,000 five-star reviews and over 60 million downloads. That tells me that people are not only using the app, but using it with a significant degree of success. One of those could be you. I know I've appreciated Headspace's direct approach to meditation. No poses, no dogma, just one simple basic question. What do you want to achieve? Once you answer that question, Headspace will direct you to the meditations they have that will help you reach your goal. You deserve to feel happier, and Headspace is meditation made simple. Go to headspace.com slash macvoices. That's headspace.com slash macvoices for a free one-month trial with access to Headspace's full library of meditations for every situation. That's the best deal offered right now, so head over to headspace.com slash macvoices today. Thanks to Headspace for their support of Mac Voices. But you did mention that when the power came back on, you binged. And I'm I'm curious, was that just out of boredom or uh, – I, I'm, I'm, no, I feel like no, I'm trying to – No, no, I watch a lot. 
I watch a lot of I watch a lot of uh, streaming TV. You know, my wife and I watch a lot of series, and and we like to find a new series because we've watched all the ones that we like. But once you've watched them, it's, most of them you you don't really want to go back and watch again this year. So we're always looking for new series to watch. So that was one thing was <clears throat> I had a few series that I didn't think my wife would care for. And so having her in Florida, it was a good opportunity. She was watching stuff in Florida with her mom that she knows I don't want to watch, like English drawing room dramas, you know, uh, Downton Abbey type stuff. It's like, yeah, I could do without that. I'm, I'm more like the Avengers. <laughs> so I watched a couple of Avengers movies. I watched... Uh, Oh, uh, WandaVision, which is just this weird spin-off of the Marvel Universe with two char- two minor characters from Avengers. Uh that's really fun. There's seven episodes out now. WandaVision. <clears throat> um I watched David Byrne's special American Utopia or yeah, American Utopia, uh which was fabulous. It's a filmed version of his Broadway It's not a play and it's not a one-man show because there's 17 or 18 musicians in it with him it's kind of a hybrid between a concert and a one-man one-man theater show and david byrne i guess tells some stories and plays some songs with this incredible band and nobody's wearing any shoes it's just like you keep looking at it and going wow great songs and why aren't they wearing shoes? What kind of instrument is that guy walking around playing? So that they are all in motion the whole time. That's not like a band where everybody stands in their spot. Everybody's wireless and, and barefoot and moving around the stage in different. It's just bizarre. Watch it if you can. It's on, I think, Netflix, but it might be HBO Plus. David Byrne, American Utopia, directed by Spike Lee. Um, which is kind of weird because it's a, like it's done in a theater like a Broadway show, and it's shot like a theatrical Broadway show. Um, so there's not a lot of that Spike Lee influence in it, but it's still really, really good. It's a, it's a very straightforward documentary of the theatrical show. It's not like it stops and they talk. It's just the whole show straight through. Really good. If, uh, even if you're not a fan of the Talking Heads, which I'm not in particular. You know, I, I could take them or leave them. Well, but if this made an impression on you, I mean, that's, that's that well, means it's definitely worth checking out. He's like, you know, David Bowie, where where he's a little more than just a singer songwriter. He's a visual artist also, and this is his visual art art the way he wants you to see it. And so, seeing it in the movie, we had seen him do this um, two summers ago at the uh, Austin City Limits Festival. Paul McCartney was playing. And David Byrne was one of the opening acts that day. So we went early and we saw David Byrne. And then, you know, we waited a few hours, saw Paul McCartney. But David Byrne did this kind of show. He had the 17 people and the bare feet. And it was the same performance, but not the whole hour and a half show. It was just like half of it, I guess. But it was really great then. And I I watched it and I went, wow, I would go see that in New York. If we were in New York, I would want to get tickets and go see that. That's really cool. I mean... It's music. It's, uh, I don't know if it's dance, but kind of dance and movement and lighting. And it's just very interesting to watch. And, uh, he did write a lot of good songs. Hey, is this a text podcast, by the way? I meant to ask. (laughs) Or, Or is this? Popular culture podcast. Hey, what it's whatever we need it to be. When when you come on, it's always interesting to see what what's going on. But I do want to take you back to this retirement thing because this is not something we've heard about a lot. And um, well, you yet, were, you must not be on my mailing list, or you must not open my emails. But for since last July, I've been saying at the end of the year, I'm going to shut down working smarter. Why? I made it um, under. I don't know, Sierra or High Sierra. So the videos are now five operating systems old. And while there's not very much in it that's not correct anymore, it looks dated. And there are new things that I would want to, I want to replace maybe some of the things that are in it with new things that I maybe think are better today after five years. And I just didn't want to do it. Five hours of video. You know what five, committing to producing five hours of video feels like. It's like 
three months of my life doing nothing but, you know, cutting video. And I love doing it, but not that much anymore. It's not, it's not a passion thing for me. And, and the thing about working smarter was it was a passion project and I got my, I got my return on investment. I helped lots of people manage their time better and, and, uh, not fall down so many rabbit holes. And, you know, that's what I wanted to do, but I don't want to do it full time for any more years because it, it's a big commitment. After you finish the video, then I'm the only one that can operate the, uh, chat rooms. 73 lessons, 73 different chat rooms, questions and answers from all the students. I, I mean, I love doing it, but it's a responsibility. And I'm thinking at my age, I'd like to be able to go out of town for a week or two and not have to do that. And, and I tried it last year, you know, uh, going off, off the grid for a few days at a time and then coming back and catching up. And it was, I didn't like it. It's like, no. I just like to not have to do all these things. I'd like to not have to manage the website. I'd like to not have to manage the mailing list. I'd like to not have to pay all of these vendors that keep the thing running, you know, every month. Because it's not cheap to run a, a distance learning operation remotely. Um, you know, I don't own the equipment that you need for that, the servers and the back end interface to create classrooms with chat rooms. I mean, I, I don't know how to do stuff like that. So I was paying for it. And at, at some point it, the trade-off just wasn't worth it anymore for me. It's like, all right, I did it. I came, I got the people I really wanted to, to take the course already. And now I, I've, I've just kind of, it's, it's on uh, YouTube and I gave it to everybody that ever paid for it and said but i'm not i'm not answering there's no chat room anymore you got the transcripts you got the videos and you can watch them for as long as you like forever for no additional charge but the business end is closing down on january 1st so on january 1st i st or february 1st it's only been three weeks um i meant to do it january 1st i just procrastinated and wasn't ready so um yeah, so I sent out an email and I, I said, anybody that wants to, that didn't bite before when it was $499, uh, $19.99, and you can watch it on YouTube for the rest of, you know, as long as YouTube is there. Um, but that's it. No support after February 1st. And uh, so I sold a bunch, you know, so I, I opened up 30 seats and sold them all. And then I said, okay, we're, it's done. And I closed it up. And so, you know, I stopped paying the webinar guy. And I stopped paying the uh, advertising guys that were uh, helping helping me uh, direct my Facebook buys. You know, they, they were analyzing them because I'm, that's beyond my skill set to figure out what I did right and what I did wrong with different executions and stuff. I just, I love marketing but I don't like the nuts and bolts of it. I want to like hire an agency and have them come to me and say, here's what happened. Here's what we recommend. And here's what we need from you. All right. See you next week. But I could never afford that. You know, it's like I always, the only way I could keep working smarter for Mac users alive was to do everything myself. I had to be a solopreneur. It was just not a profitable enough operation to hire lots of people. So I had, consultants like that early on and then later just kind of relied on my mailing list. I had about 4,000 people on the mailing list. And periodically I'd offer a deal or I'd offer a bundle or I'd offer a, a different class and it worked out. I made, I, I'd say over the five years I didn't lose any money. And that's, that's the thing is I didn't get rich either. And I, I kind of hoped it would take off to the point where I could hire real people and, you know, make it a real business with, people answering tech support 24 seven and things like that, but it didn't. And now it's gone. Poof. And that leaves me with so much extra time. I'm just, you know, I can go places like I, I can go skiing. I can go visit my kids. Um, you know, until the summer when I have to write three books again, but for now, 
it opens up a lot of time on my calendar. So I still do consulting. I still, um, still do one-on-one, you know, if people want it, it's, uh, there are a lot of options out there for getting support. I'm kind of a specialized option, but, uh, if you're going to pay for help, I'm not that much more expensive than anybody else. And I have certain, certain skills that might be appropriate for certain people. You know, there's, I have some clients that just, you know, have had other people try to help them and they just don't relate. So I still do that, but I haven't done any this year. I don't think I've had one like paid. Cl- oh yeah. I had one paid client this year and he was in Austin. It was a real house call with social you know, distancing and masks. Yeah. So many things there, Bob, that, you know, I, I, I sometimes do wonder, you know, you talk about five hours of video taking three months to produce and to do it right for the kind of video you were doing. I mean, it's not a run and gun video. You're trying to create a product. I don't think a lot of folks a understand. Three, three camera shoot, a three camera shoot. Yep. See, there you go. Plus uh, screen movies and great, you know, titling and music and consistency through 73 episodes. It's, it's a lot. It's a, it's a quite a workload. And I didn't relish doing it again, especially with the same material I did already. You know, it's like if I was going to spend uh, months doing video, I'd like to do a rock opera or something. I mean, you know, I'd like to just edit something different, not the same 73 lessons I had last time with new screen movies and, you know, maybe a few different names. Just wasn't the thing I want. And plus, I really do want to retire. Like, I'm I'm of a mixed mind about the books. They're not that much work, and they are my babies. You know, they, they I I I wrote the first edition, and I've literally every year improved them a little bit. You know, it's like I like to think that every year I've gotten them a little bit more focused. I, I've gotten rid of the stuff that wasn't working and added stuff that's useful. And so these books are like they're like children. And I'm not sure I'm ready to give them up because if when I say I won't do an update, then they'll hire somebody else to do it. I'll get some money, I think, for the first year or two, but not very much. But I don't have any say in who gets to do it after that. So, you know, somebody's going to inherit my stuff. Now, I am uh, lobbying and I may, may have some influence. I'm lobbying for my replacement. But I have no idea. You know, it's like somebody really awful might inherit my books and yeah. make them terrible. Yeah. I don't so, know. You know? Well, so the, you said though, at the, at the start of our discussion that you're still writing two columns a week. Is that correct? Yeah. For okay. the Houston Chronicle, and one for you, our friends at Mac Observer. Okay. It's That's usually good. about the same column. Like uh, the deal is it's the same column. But I always do something for Mac Observer to make it different. You know, it's like I'll add some some text or I'll add pictures. I don't get to do pictures for the Chronicle. And a lot of times I have more to say than I can say in 500 words in the Chronicle. So my my uh, Mac Observer columns generally run a little longer than the, the newspaper version of it. And I, I, almost nobody's noticed, you know. I mean, it's not like there's overlap between the, the readerships. I guess there's Mac Observer readers in Houston, but they get it. You know, like they don't have to subscribe to the newspaper now. They can just read me on Mac Observer and know that they're getting the the meat of the matter. Well, and too, we both know that writing for the web is a lot less constricting than trying to write for paper because you don't have the editing. You can you can have it your way a whole lot more. Well, and uh, there's a level of technical detail that uh, is more appropriate for Mac Observer. You know, it's like for, for the Houston Chronicle, I'm writing at a very low technical level um, because I'm addressing a non-technical base. It's not These aren't people who joined a club to be Mac people. These are people who bought a newspaper. And so uh, where I might like uh, write a column about troubleshooting. I'm pretty careful not to write columns with a lot of step-by-step instructions in them because a lot of these people just, it would be crazy. I'd be buried alive with, so I did what you said. And now the the cup holder is open on my Mac. (laughs) Haven't heard that one for a while. (laughs) Oh yeah. I remember that. 
We'll have more with Bob Dr. McLevitis in the next edition of Mac Voices, where he talks about combining the analog and digital worlds, something he's very familiar with and has gotten into uh, recently a whole lot more. That's next time on Mac Voices. Until then, and as always, I'm Chuck Joyner. Thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode. You will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.